Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for making time for this. Uh, you have a new album called Find a Way Home coming soon, which uh, I want to talk about. But before I do that, I have to share something that's been bothering me for about 20 years, which is uh, I think it was Warp Tour 2001, I think, at the Gorge. And, you know, there's that here in Washington. And there's that one part, if you remember, where it's like one lane each way on the highway out there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I remember there was somebody who was tailgating me super aggressively, like that whole time. And he finally passed us. And the person with me was like, dude, that's Yuri from MXPX. And I'm still <laughs> scarred. I'm still, I can't confirm that it was him. I don't know. That's just what they told me, but I'm still scarred. Was it a Honda Civic hatchback? I don't remember. A tan one with an MXPX I don't remember. poke it at your punk on the back. I'll you. say yes. I don't remember, but I'll say yes just to make a good story, even though Yuri, I don't remember. Yuri is a menace on the road. He is just like, get out of my way. So okay, so it probably was him. Probably. Got it. <laughs> I have um, no idea. Well, who knows? Well, let's just let's just say it was him. Okay. Um, well, I, I want to talk about the new album stuff, but I'm also really curious to know about the early days because we're both about the same age and we're both from smaller towns that you know people call seattle but actually they're both pretty far from seattle you're from bremerton i'm from snohomish and back then at least in my view there was really not a lot going on in terms of punk or anything like that you know people think there was because of grunge and all that stuff but it really was not a lot going on in terms of music what was your experience like back then in Bremerton? And, you know, did you ever dream that the band would become what it is? Yeah, I'm with you on the fact that, like, there wasn't a lot going on back then that, that was on a national level. But for us, yeah. it was all about the local scene because when grunge was happening, we were too young. Like, we're too young for grunge. Even if right. we wanted to be part of the shows, we we're, you know, you had to be 21 to get into most yep. of those those bars. Um, so it really was a bar scene, which is so funny to think about now that I've been 21 for a while now, you know, but uh, <laughs> a couple of years, <laughs> but, but back then, though, back then it was all anybody all talked about is like, man, when we turn 21, it, the world's going to just open up to us. Right. So as far as punk rock goes, everything like that, it was local. So there was a, a local band called Bad Juju. I watched them practice and I was just blown away. They sounded kind of like a cross between Bad Religion, the Minutemen kind of their own thing they had these like kind of triumphant songs you know where you know the guitar would ring out and the bass player would be doo -doo 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 -doo, like stuff and it was just like okay i'm playing bass you know and I, that's what okay. inspired me to start playing bass um and i i naively uh when bad juju needed a new drummer i was just about to get this band started like my buddy jeremy played drums he was awesome and I'm like, Jeremy, uh, my buddy's bad, bad juju are looking for somebody to sit in with them. And uh, so he goes over there, literally first practice. He's just jamming with them. All right, he's in the band. They go on to like play all these shows. I'd see him at shows with two girls, two girls on, you know, one on each arm. I just be <laughs> like, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> but we found Yuri. So all is well. <laughs> I mean, it's but, kind uh, of crazy that you guys found such a good lineup in Bremerton, which is not like exactly a hotbed of like music, especially back then. You know, it's funny is like back in the day, everybody, it, it still was a thing where you couldn't find a good drummer. And right, that's right. still true today, I think. But I remember calling up my friend, Eric, he played drums. I'm like, Eric, what's up? He ended up playing guitar in the cooties, but I go, Hey, I'm looking for a drummer. I want to start a band. And he's like, Oh, uh, I switched to guitar. I'm just like, wah, wah, wah. But I know this dude named Yuri. And so I, I got Yuri's number. I called him up. We went over to his house. His mom made us nachos. It was amazing. <laughs> Very so, wholesome. Yeah, it was so wholesome. It was, it was opposite of the scene that I was seeing down the street from my house, which was the bad juju practice room. It was, you go down there, there's like punk posters all over the place. It's a ba dank basement right everybody takes smoke breaks everybody's smoking cigarettes and you know it's not like they were drinking and stuff because it was during the day and they were kids but everybody was smoking their cigarette like, we're gonna take a smoke break and so i'm just like wide-eyed kind of just looking at this and the first show i went to was bad juju local and it was just this party 
in Port Orchard, Washington. Um, I met the 1230 dream time or yeah, 1230 dream time guys. They, they, they were, they're still kind of like legendary musicians around this area, but um, it all started with, with those shows back in the day. I mean, the biggest, like the big show I went to first was U2, U2. I want to say it's zoo TV tour, right? At so the like dome or something. Yeah, it was at the Kingdom. It was huge. It was T- Kingdom or Tacoma Dome. It might have been Tacoma Dome, but huge show. I, of course, I was a fan. But then shortly after that, I got into punk rock and, you know, through these bad juju guys. And that was when I realized, oh, you can you can just do this. You don't have to, ha- right. to be at the Tacoma Dome. You could just do this in the garage. And that started it all for us. We started promoting our shows. We started of course, you know, we started the band before we did that. But once we started going, we we're promoting ourselves DIY all the way, making our own flyers, drawing them up, going to Kinko's or whatever it was at the time, usually a corner store, get the five cent copies, post them right. on, the, on the telephone poles around town. And, and that was what we knew to do. So that's what we did. And really quickly, I also wanted to mention my Patreon. If you like what I do on YouTube and everywhere else, joining my Patreon really helps me do this full time and worry less about videos getting demonetized by YouTube or copyright claimed by labels. Patrons get all my podcasts and main channel videos early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I also do giveaways. For example, I've been giving away a lot of Emo's Not Dead merch. And you can also have me review your music, artwork, or anything else. All need to do is join my Patreon at the $10 level. And then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. And then I will review it live on Twitch. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And I appreciate your support. And you guys signed to tooth and nail pretty early. And back then the tooth and nail scene had nothing to do with like, you know, the quote unquote real punk scene, you know, in Seattle, which is you know, I, I, I liked both at the time, but it was like, I remember like John from undertow making fun of me for wearing like an unashamed shirt, which was like a, a tooth and nail band back then. Mm-hmm. It was, it was really not acceptable to like be into any of the tooth and nail bands back then. But it, it, you know, if you talk to those bands, it's not like any of them felt like, and I'd be curious to know what you think. It's not like any of those bands back then felt like they were separate or like it wasn't coming from them. No, not at all. You're right. You're absolutely right. We were just kids like you, just kids like everybody. You know, um, I happened to grow up going to youth group, things like that, you know, and so like that. But at the same time, like my music had nothing to do with that. I love. Right. Once I got into punk rock, I got into all. And then I discovered uh-huh. Descend- Descendants and all pretty much at the same time, although I didn't really understand what that was. Right. But these are the, the cassette tape days. So you get a cassette tape that's dubbed from a buddy you don't know what this is. You're just like, this is right. all to me. It <laughs> you don't sounded... even know what they look like. You don't know anything about them. Yeah. When I first heard all, it was, uh, all Roy revenge. I think it, mm-hmm. it, it sounded like a live album to me. Cause I just hadn't yeah. really heard punk music yet. And so from there, you know, black flag, Henry Rollins band, um, got into the clash, bad religion, no effects, all of these bands it discovered rancid, you know, after we were discovered, um, op ivy at a local show they were playing op ivy on the on the on the pa and i'm like what is mm-hmm. this this is really weird and really cool <laughs> right you know and it's like just punk like punk reggae what is this yeah so hearing that stuff for the first time i heard it all here in kitsap county and um but at the same time we still had our own little insular scene going on where uh i joke about this but we got made fun of because MXPX was too light. We we're too too soft. Totally, you know, absolutely. And so <laughs> we just MXPX be... was gay back then. Yeah, 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 yeah. But because it like, wasn't, you know, whatever, no effects or whatever. Yeah, it wasn't heavy enough. It was too local for one. Like, what are you kids right. trying to trying to do? What you know, these bands that we really like are trying to do. But yeah. that's literally what it what it was. Is every band that I've I've ever like really run into across across my years of of doing this, they all started out kind of like we're doing, which is just, all right, I met some people. We love this. We went to some shows. We're like, oh my gosh, you know, like there's so many people on the East coast I talked to where they're going to hardcore shows. Um, You know, Vinny, you know, Vinny Caruana, you know, from the movie life, Uh, you know, he, 
you know, me and him are pretty good friends. And, you know, he's just talking about like how he just got, got sort of like pressured into joining a band and singing. Like, like he wasn't even thinking about it. And they're like, you should do this. You're like, sing on this or whatever, you know? And, but for me, it was, uh, it was just being wide eyed watching these young local other bands play and going, I it seemed like just larger than life. It just seemed like the most amazing thing in the world. In hindsight, it was just a local band, but it was so amazing at the time. Absolutely. I looked around at this show, like the same show that, that I heard Op Ivy for the first time. It was, it was the uh, Sunny Slope Grange. And there was a big, a big brawl that actually ended the show early. <laughs> but it was skinheads came in and started just t- mm-hmm. you know, fighting with, with uh, people. And, but anyway, I just remember thinking to myself, and this was before MXPX wasn't really a band yet. You know, we might have been like, I'm in with trying to do it, but this was real early, probably 19, 1991, I would say. Um, and just looking around and going, like, they promoted this show. Like, they rented that PA. Right. And they're like letting people in and like people are paying like whatever, $2 cover or something like that. And I think it just clicked for me that, like, okay, I see a path. I see something right. that we can do. And so like when we, we could start- come up with 50 bucks for a PA and some flyers. This isn't like, this isn't out of like the reach of what we could do. Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, you know, I, I give, you know, Kitsap County, Washington, you know, all the credit for like getting us started with MXPX and the DIY ethic that we have. I just remember thinking it was so cool that there was somebody that wrote a song about Bremerton. <laughs> like, wow, a city I've heard of. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to somebody from outside Bremerton that lives here now. I was talking to her today. She was cutting my hair. And uh, she, she, she was very shocked and surprised when I said that people know Bremerton, or at least used to know Bremerton, as a trashy town. Because it really was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so different nowadays. Like, nowadays, it's, it's cleaned up. I mean... Every, yeah. every town has its issues, right? But it's still a little rough around the edges. It's a Navy <laughs> town, you know, of course, but yeah. I, I just see it so different than the way I think totally. it was seen, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when you signed to tooth and nail, which was what, 93 or four or something like that, um, were you kind of aware of the perception of, of the label and, and, and how that might affect how people saw MXPX or how did you think about that? That's a great question. Let me let you in on some like secrets here. (laughs) And to be clear, I am a fan of tooth and nail just, just to set the stage for everybody. No, 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 it's all good. Uh, But it's a great question because at the time we knew nothing. Like you got to think pre-internet era. This was, this was cassette tape. You knew a band because of your friend or your sister or your brother, right? Like that that for me, like maybe Salmon Thrasher. Exactly. Like if I could get That's a hold it. of like an old Thrasher magazine, but yeah. So I heard Pennywise for the first time, w- working my job. I had already started MXPX. MXPX was a band, and I'm working this Spiro's job, washing dishes, busting tables, and I hear it was a bunch of punkers back there. So I hear Pennywise. I hear all these like lag wagon for the first time, and I'm just like, holy shit! So like, I think a lot of people think of MXPX as peers of Lagwagon and Pennywise, because but mm-hmm. we are a little younger, so like they had yeah. gotten their start, they had put out albums before us, and so hearing that was like whoa. And 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 so to answer your question about Tooth and Nail, we didn't know anything. We only knew what we could hear accidentally, washing dishes in the back room of Spiros, <laughs> you know, like that kind right. of thing. Um, I wasn't tuned into like zines yet or magazines really. Didn't have cable, didn't have MTV. Um, you know, I grew up kind of just like government cheese. You know, we got we got the sure. government cheese to eat. We got, you know, your channel, three channels on TV. The one that played G.I. Joe's in the morning was always blurry. <laughs> right. And that that was life for me. It was like, yeah. okay. Let's, so, so I think that helped me. I mean, me. how would you be aware of any of these things, really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when, when they came knocking on the door, we want to do a seven inch first, this was through Aaron Sprinkle, who we played some shows with his band, poor old Lou. They were more Mm -hmm. of an alternative band than a punk band. But I think that's why we stuck out to all these guys in Seattle was there's little kids playing skate punk. It's fun. And it's really good. You know, (laughs) you know, so, and and, I mean, you guys were very good from the, from the beginning. 
for what we did, I feel like we were. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. like real it still holds up now. You listen to old stuff, it's like, wow, this is like shockingly good for a bunch of little kids from Bremerton. I appreciate that. And I think that's what got us in the door at these like parties we'd play in Seattle. We'd play these like college um U district houses where they just pack the place. I mean, I'm like you can't even bring in gear. It's so packed. And people are like letting you in. That to me was just like, where are we? And right. how far is this from Bremerton? Because <laughs> we didn't know anything like that. You know, we didn't go to yeah. parties. We didn't even, we can talk about drinking later, but <laughs> we yeah. weren't really drinkers. You know, I drank before, but it wasn't a thing that you could just go and find in my I didn't town. go to like an actual party until I was probably like 20. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, I, I accidentally came, went to a few. Smoked my first joint in junior high, you know, got drunk in fourth grade off of Lucky okay. Lager. But <laughs> but those experiences were sort of like they didn't they didn't enter me into a life of insanity. You know, like I just right. kind of like was like, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and right, so I right. didn't do it again for a while. But but uh, but yeah, with Tooth and Nail, like we just signed and they wanted to sign it. They were from California at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's right. We literally still down in Orange County or whatever. We had never heard of them. We'd never heard of them until they wanted to sign us, mm -hmm. which is which is different because we had heard of Lookout Records. We had heard of Epitaph. Uh, I think Fat Records was maybe getting started around that. I'm not quite sure on the timeline. Um, if it was, it was just barely. Yeah, but Tom Wisniewski, our guitar player, once we all got into punk rock, he was much, much more of a better enthusiast than I was as far as like knowing all the names of all the band guys, knowing all the albums, knowing the names of the songs. Mm -hmm. Like I knew all that. I knew all the, the songs and I listened to all those records, but he knew even more than me. So I was, you know, he was always the guy that, that, that I would ask questions to. Like when, when I'm trying to think of memories from our tours, yeah. I'll be like, I'm going to have to text the group because <laughs> they always right. know. They always know. But I was always focused on honestly MXPX on once I started writing right. songs, once I started doing the thing, I was always the point guy that was like, okay, talk to this person, set this up, produce this. I didn't realize it was producing at the time, but it'd be like, you know, produce sure. a show, promote a show, produce a video, produce a, you know, we made two full length albums on cassette tape before we ever released Poconatcha, our first album. And they oh, were I just know that. demo albums. One was called, I like orange station wagons. One was just <laughs> called the green tape. It didn't have a name on it. And Very these local were just, band names. Just, yeah, just demo, just like a demo tape of us practicing all our songs, you know, like not messing up. So we'd like record one and it was a boom box in the middle of the garage. Mm -hmm. Like we'd, we'd listen to it, be like, oh, we need more bass. We'd either turn the <laughs> bass up a little bit or push the boom box over Move, towards the yeah. bass. That was our, our, our method. So you're mixing. <laughs> Yeah, we've come a long way. Yeah. Now we have our own studio here and, and we record our own albums here. But So you, you signed a tooth and nail and when did you sort of start to understand a little bit more about, you know, the, the bigger picture of how that was seen? Oh, it took us years. It took us so many years. Um, we were always just just carrot in front and just going towards that. And, and um, we took everybody at face value. We trusted everyone, everybody we, we talked to. We were so naive. We really were, Finn. We were, we were small town boys that were earnest and honest, and wanted to do good. and And I feel like in a lot of ways we had to prove ourselves that much more because of that. We had to mm -hmm. work hard, uh, always be a, you know be ready to go. We weren't from L.A., so the opportunities were less than say somebody yeah. that was down down south. Um, we had to plan ahead a little bit more as far as that stuff goes. Um, but you know, I, I think it's kind of part of what makes MXPX MXPX where we, we, uh, we're not like, I mean, that's bands. what, that's why I always liked the band because even though I was into like hardcore and death metal and stuff back then, I mean, I still am, but I, I was never like that, like super edgy. And I grew up like, I had a really fucked up family and stuff. So I was around a lot of like really edgy, dark stuff. And like, I never wanted, like, I, I wanted away from that. You know what I mean? Which is why, even though I was never like Christian or anything like that, I was into a lot of the tooth and nail bands for that reason. 
So I'm like, I want to get away from the stuff that my parents and their friends were into. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, for me, it was like I grew up Huey Lewis. I grew up on Michael Jackson and like all the top 40 type stuff from the 80s. Like I was really, that's what I listened to. And before that, Beatles, Beatles. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like I grew up on the Beatles. That's hugely influenced my songwriting. Um, and honestly, I feel like it's influenced like no effects. You know, the way Fat Mike sure. writes, very influenced by the Beatles, whether he would admit it or not. But just the fact that there's just weird hooks all over the place, you know, and, and that's what I try to do. And, and that's like a lot of bands I like, like no effects. I think they have weird hooks all over the place too. So uh, yeah, I started listening to all that stuff just basically because my parents had it on or I, I liked that. And so I grabbed that. Um, I was heavily influenced by the violent femmes. So mm -hmm. my, my mom actually introduced me to them, which is, it's like, it's kind of wild that my mom like <laughs> even knew about them for one, but yeah, but um, they're bass lines, you know, I just, yeah. Uh, to me, that's, that's what I want to play bass like. I love that kind of thing. So um, a very eclectic beginning of my musical sort of influence. And then once I got into punk, it was all Descendants, all No Effects, all Rancid, all, you know, Clash, things like that. Of course, the Ramones have been a staple throughout my, my life. Screeching Weasel. Love that style. Love love what they do. I always remember listening to them when I was working as a maintenance guy. Um, I didn't even have a license yet, so I was, I was probably 15. Um, I'd get picked up my, by my buddy Rich. He got me the job. It's always like, oh, yeah, just get me the job. Bring me along. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I've always been like that. I, I think because I'm a musician, I want to do my own thing. And so, like, make money here, make money here. But I want to, like, be free to do my own thing. So, even early, early on, I was like that. Um, but yeah, listening to Screeching, Screeching Weasel in the, in the truck on the way to go clean up some rental house, you know, after somebody trashed it. Those are good memories. And, you know, those probably stick with me more than I even think about on a daily basis. That's how, you know, we're old. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> it's interesting how Screeching Weasel is like, they were so influential back then and such a big deal in the 90s, and you don't really hear their name come up very much now, which is kind of weird. Yeah, you don't, but they they do really well with their fans. Like, they've got right. a, a very rabid fan base, but I, I agree. I feel like there's a lot of bands like that. Even MXPX doesn't come up as much as I feel like they should, to be honest. Like, people need to start talking about us more, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is but, interesting, though, that, like, I'm always fascinated by how the perception of bands changes over the years and you know like we talked about you know back then there were plenty of people who kind of wrote mxpx off for whatever reason but i would say you know now 20 25 years later i think mxpx is like pretty much universally respected um you know among like i mean I, you're never going to hear anyone say anything bad about, about mxpx now um how have you kind of seen that from the other side of things as far as how you know people see the band and how that's changed over the years well, I always say, you know, if, if nobody hates you, you're not doing anything right, you know? <laughs> so, sure. So somebody should be hating on you. But <laughs> but I, I feel like you're right. Like over the years, um, bands that in the past have sort of been like, no, you know, like keep those guys away from us um, only because they had never met us, you know, just hearing a bad opinion or something. And yeah, and those people have have come through over the years and been like hey we're cool sorry about that like this kind of stuff you know like and fans have done that too but um i think it's just because people tell their own stories people people yeah, just right. naturally tell their own story and that story and, and of course as you know a lie gets spread 10 times 90 times faster than than the truth so of course so any kind of salaciousness any kind of like oh yeah mxpx did this i, I mean i've yeah. heard some crazy stories but <laughs> almost none of them were true and i almost wish some of them were but uh, mike herrera kidnapped my mom yeah that could be true but it's probably the <laughs> other way around i got kidnapped by your mom <laughs> so that the record be. will reflect it <laughs> stand so, corrected yeah. So when we signed to Tooth and Nail, we were just going for it earnestly. Let's we weren't even trying to get signed. Here's the crazy part. Like most people, including Tom Wisniewski, 
had a band before he joined MXPX called Evolution of Man. Very much like Bad Religion style lyrics about evolution and whatever. Yeah. Um, he was the drummer. And they sent their demo into every single punk label, Epitaph, Lookout, I think Fat eventually. Um, and they got these rejection le letters back. And I was just like, we never did that. We never sent one thing into any label. And, and I think it's due to my lack of follow through because <laughs> that ADHD thing where I'll like be yeah. super focused on something, but then I won't finish it and then I'll go over here. So I think that's called being a musician. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we, we never did that. But so when, when Aaron Sprinkle told Tooth and Nail about us and they came calling, we're like, huh? Oh, okay, sure. We'll sign. Nobody else is trying to sign us. So we, we just didn't realize you're supposed to go out there and like make it happen. Um, and, and I would say we didn't necessarily think we were ready to be signed. Like we were just sure. trying to be a local band, do our own shows, put on shows, make that happen. I wasn't thinking career. I know the very beginning of this question was, did you ever think you were going to still be here after all these years? No, I mean, I, I never think more than like one or two years ahead, literally <laughs> yeah. at all. And, and, and so for me, I was like, I don't think I'm going to go to college. Uh, I have no real desire to, so I'm just going to play this out and see how it goes. And that's literally, that was my life plan to see how it goes. I mean, I didn't think like, I never once thought about what I wanted to do with my life or what my career would be or anything like that until I was probably like 19. The thought literally mm -hmm. never crossed my mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a little yeah. scary. Well, it's different back then than it is today. Yeah. Um, I know you hear about the, oh, go to college, go to college, go to trade school, go, go in the Navy, whatever. But today, it's, it must be just insane. I mean, one, there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of different places you can go and choose to do. So it's just like that's got to be a little bit uh, – make you anxious a little bit. Like if you're yeah, a young No one person, ever pressured me about it. Nobody asked, yeah. like, what are you going to do? Like I just – it just wasn't a conversation. <laughs> I think that's better, man. If you just accidentally fall into a career – and you're like, oh, here I am. Let's keep going. Right. Like that's a, that's that's lucky. That's amazing. I mean, how could a 17 year old? I mean, I guess it's good to have a plan, but how could a 17 year old? Like, I could barely fucking tie my shoes then, let alone have any sort of coherent plan for what I would be as an adult. Yeah, I mean, the the, the most we planned was okay. Um, I'm gonna try to go on tour. You know, and so I have to like let my job know. Hey, I'm gonna be gone for two months. <laughs> I came back. I never got back on the on the on the schedule. They were pretty much yeah. like, "Nope, see you later." So, right. but but yeah, I mean, as far as plans go, like, you're so right. Like, it it's good to have plans, but I think if we would have had a plan, one, it wouldn't have happened, and right. two, two, it's just like what happened was so much better. So I I just don't question it too much. I mean, a question. And your plan things. would have probably been like, "Oh, we want to put out a seven inch on Lookout, and then if we do that, like, I'm done. I can die happy. That's the top of the mountain." Yeah, I, I mean, you're, 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 you're thinking of a time where I literally didn't think I would ever be old. I didn't think I would ever <laughs> right. be an adult. And I'm not saying that you know how people say, "Oh, I'd be dead by now." I'm not saying that. Like, I just literally never thought about it. Like, to yeah. me, it wasn't, it he, wasn't the same life. Like, 23 might as well be a hundred. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so now sitting here in this body, it's like, wow, we've, how did this happen? Yeah. How does this happen? You just <laughs> you blink in it and it's, you know, you're time warped. But, but the thing is, is, is we have a document, we have music, we have videos, we have pictures, you know, I, I've got so many pictures that I like have just sitting in these like old envelopes they're actual printed out pictures you know i'm not saying they're all gold or anything but but it's cool to have that document you know just to look back on I mean, at some I mean, point playing okay. uh, at some point writing songs playing music it's got to be about what's right in front of you it's got to be about mm -hmm. what is pressing what what's what are you feeling right now um but there is a part of me that's just like I really like the fact that we have all these albums and we can like each, each record we press is another album that I can just slide into, into the shelf. And so like that to me is kind of cool. It's like dopamine, 
being satisfied mm-hmm. by like somebody liking a millionaire post or something like that. It's the same feeling. Like if you have a bunch of albums on the shelf, you're like, why did we do the artwork like that that one time? Oh yeah, that's why. And you you think back. So yeah, if I don't well, see I'm, it, I don't think about it. I, I'm always interested in talking to people who've been doing their thing as long as you have and sort of how they think about their work, you know, with you guys having now almost, I guess, 30 years behind um, and, and kind of how you think about that. How would you rank your studio albums? Cause you got a bunch of live stuff and whatnot, but your studio albums there, how would you rank them in your personal opinion at this moment in time from worst <laughs> to best? Worst to best. I mean, they're all best. They're all worst. Um, uh huh. Yeah, you're like, yeah, I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know what you mean. But gun to your head. Oh, my God. Well, you know, I never like to personally rank things because I know people have their favorites. Yeah. So maybe I could generalize a little bit. I would say sure. because uh, I don't know when or this pl- is how about How about this? You could maybe say, where should someone else start? I, I would say start with the new album, of course, always. Naturally. Because it's what you're doing right now. It's what it's what a band is up to. It's like, okay, this yeah. is what the world looks like in our eyes. Um, but I would say ranking all of them the way I want to sound, the way I want to sound, the last two records are the way I want to sound. So like, it started with self-titled in 2018. You hear Let's Ride. That sounds like we sound live, I feel like. It okay. sounds like when you see a live show, yeah, okay, aside from me forgetting a lyric or two or something like that, but maybe Tom screws up a guitar part. But aside from that, it sounds like what we sound live. And that's kind of what I was go- you know, what I was going for on that record. And on this new record, we started with that vibe, but then just added some extra little bits and pieces that mm-hmm. maybe aren't as live. But um, from there, I really feel like sonically – I really, really like a mix between a secret weapon, the way that mix sounds, and like the song itself, especially. Um, definitely my favorite song on Secret Weapon. Um, and then the sound of life in general. So like okay. those two sounds, like Secret Weapon's very polished, but still has still has like energy. It has punch to it. And yeah. then you put like life in general, that's just pure raw motion, raw energy. Um, those are probably my favorite two sounding records aside from the okay. new ones. The new ones are like the ever passing moment like. is my personal favorite. Cause I kind of feel like it's a mm. little bit of both of those things. It still sounds yeah. like, well, I mean, you guys never changed your sound really, but like it still sounds like the old MXPX, but it's definitely a little bit more polished. It's got that major label kind of production to it and stuff. So that, that's my personal favorite. That was all Jerry Finn. Jerry Finn like made that oh, sound. Oh, okay. I didn't know he yeah. did that one. There we yeah, go. Yeah, he did that. Yeah. And I loved the sound of the record too. At the time, it was exactly what we wanted. Um, I would say right now, I would take the verb down slightly. But like, I don't want to see. I hate saying that kind of stuff because I really don't care that much. Like, it doesn't bother right. me. And uh, nobody hears that other than you or right, you know, right. engineers. Nobody hears that shit. Yeah. I hope like, so. You're like, oh, that reverb's a little plastic. And like, I don't even know what that means. I just like the chorus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like getting able to do, you know, records in-house, it's just so stress-free. It's fun. We can try things. I mean, we've tried things, you know, on all the records, but I feel like for a while there, we were just rushing through the process. Let's just get this done. Let's rush through it. And um, And with this new album, we tried not to do that. We tried to just... It takes as long as it takes. Let's just, if we have to redo anything, we'll redo stuff. Like there will legit be like, we'll be done with a song, done recording. I'll get the mix. And I'll be like, you know what? I got to redo this bridge. I'm just not feeling the bridge. It just doesn't have the energy I need or, or things like that. Like I've, I've done that. And Which you can't do when you, I mean, I guess you could, but you don't want to do that when you're paying two grand a day for some fancy studio in LA. Exactly. You really don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay. Even Jerry, if you should. Call up somebody like Jerry Finn. They're like, hey, can you come down and like redo this bridge part? Like, yeah. come on. So, yeah. Love being able to do that. So is that but, is that a big part of the reason, I guess, starting, are, you're still independent. Is that right? We are still independent. Yeah. So is that a big, 
I mean, you've had lots of options. I'm sure there's tons of labels that would want to sign you. What made you choose to go that route? You know, I feel like we screw things up all the time and labels screw things up all the time. So we might as well just do it ourselves at that <laughs> point. Um, it's workload. It really is. It's a lot of work. But because MXPX is my full-time job, um, although Goldfinger, but it doesn't take much time. I don't have to do business. Sure. Um, I, I don't know. Like it literally is the difference between houses. Like, can I afford to pay for four or five houses? Not if I'm on a record label, you know? So right. like record labels are great to just like keep you going, keep you promoted. They're not great to keep you paid. And sure. we got bills to pay up here in MXPX land. And so we found that DIY is, is more stressful, but it's more money. So like we can yeah. just, Bring in more cash, more capital to put back into, you know, all the things we do here, live streams, free live streams, not having to charge people for sure. every nickel dimey thing. And um, and we do the the merch store ourselves, mxpx.com. We run that. My mom actually manages the store. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, it's awesome because like who who else are you gonna trust? I mean, some people have terrible moms that you shouldn't trust, but <laughs> my mom's been pretty solid. So yeah. uh, you know, it's just like it's it's uh it's not a situation that most bands actually have the opportunity to take advantage of so it's not even like oh i'm going to do this because this is the best way i'm going to do this because i have the opportunity to do this because this this presented itself my parents happen to be awesome and they help me out with the business and so it just works out so everything we ship out we ship out from bremerton and you know, it, it makes things a little harder in some ways, but like I said, it brings in a lot more you of that. You get to keep a lot of, of the money instead of keeping 15% of it. I hate talking about money on these things, you know, because <laughs> people don't like to hear about that. And I, I certainly don't don't enjoy those conversations, but it is true. I mean, it is But it's reality. It's, it's reality. reality. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um. So uh, is this what you foresee the direction of MXPX forever as far as staying independent, self-producing, all that kind of stuff? Or are you just going to kind of see what happens? Um, I would never say that, that, that I know what the future holds for us. You know, we turn on a dime sometimes when we see a new thing to try, um, like with the live streams that we, we've been doing the last couple of years. Yeah. That was something we had never really done. Um, maybe one or two, right? Just like everybody else. But we kind of just saw that there's a future in that. And so we put mm -hmm. our put our money into that, bought a bunch of cameras. And now those cameras are actually sort of getting old. And <laughs> we got to like re-up it and the, the, all the equipment. We just bought a new computer. So it just never ends as far as like reinvesting. But the real question yeah, is- Yeah, but you got to pay for that stuff either way. The label, if the label buys that stuff, they're, you're going to, you know, you're going to pay one way or the other. And you're going to pay a big percentage on top of that for yeah. interest or, or, you know, whatever. But- but no, I, I don't think – I think at some point we will partner with people. We will partner with bigger companies than us because I think the world is moving in in a even more monolithic kind of way. Meaning I think so too, which is companies. weird because a lot of people think that like because of social media that labels don't matter. But I, I think that they actually matter more than ever in a lot of ways because they can help you cut through the noise. Um, and MXPX is an established band. So, you know, you guys have a brand, but for like a newer artist, that's just one of 9 million newer artists. How the fuck are they going to any get anybody to notice them? Like you could do, you know, people do it on their own for sure, but having, you know, hopeless or fueled by ramen or whatever on your side is sure going to help, you know, whether uh, you think that's worth it for you financially or not is another decision to make. But if you want to get noticed, they'll help you do it. Yeah. I mean, the huge caveat is the fact that we are established. We were established before the internet age, and we have, yeah, you know, that fan base that's loyal, awesome. So, like, I never take that for granted. I want to. I'm always grateful for that. But I do admit, it's definitely a different game if you're starting out with no yep. previous name, no previous, you know, fan base. It's a whole different game changer. So, um, but as far as MXPX, I still do want to stay open to possible deals because. If somebody's going to come up, like, like say, like with the PGA tour and the Saudi, uh, oh, yeah, like, right. Live, live golf, live golf. golf. Yeah. 
Like, I'm not saying I want to take Saudi money because I don't. Like, I am, I am an underdog. Unless it's, guy. unless it's a lot of money. <laughs> I'm an underdog guy. But if somebody's like, hey, we yeah. want you, we want to give you billions of dollars to help change the world for a better way, I'm like, I'm going to be skeptical for sure. Like, I'm going to be like, wait, yeah. what? What are you doing here? But, but if there ever was like a magical deal and there won't be kids, there's no easy button, there won't yep. be that magical deal. Sure, I'm open to it. Um, but I'm even open to, to like partnerships. Like, we're, we're, you know, you know, just talking to people that are out there. Um, I think that's what it's about. It's about just connecting with a, a band like MXPX. It's about connecting with other bands that you love, or that we love. Sorry, uh, not well. You love too, right? Uh, but <laughs> and then other other people. You know, people in the world doing interesting things that have their own audience, like you have. So I think that's what bands need to be doing more of. Is just, of course, send out videos to your own audience. But that is your audience, and not, yep. it's not going to get further past that. And your point to having a record label, you can get past your audience with with collaborating with more people. But you're also going to pay for it. So how do you weigh that? You know, that's you up to you. It. Yeah, there's got to be a yeah. some sort of uh, balance. Yeah, that's why I think it's insane that like there's artists who think that they should be on a label, but also own their own masters, like. That makes no sense. Why in the fuck would a label sign you and then give you your masters? That's just like, it makes no sense. I'll take that deal. I'll take the masters. <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> but why would they, like, that's like just them donating money to you. That makes, why would a label ever do that? They, why they, would an artist think that they deserve it? It makes no sense. Yeah, it depends kind of on the artist. Obviously, if you're the Eagles, you're going to want to, you're going to want to ask for your masters if you put out a new album, something like that. But um, but new new bands asking for their masters, that's that's ballsy. If you can get it, good luck. Yeah, absolutely. Might as well ask. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like uh, M uh, Michael Jordan. They're saying that he kind of ruined shoe deals for for the newer generation because he had the one or two percent of all right. sales, which is huge if you're selling right. as many shoes as he's selling. But if you're like a smaller guy selling, you know, a hundred thousand shoes, that's nothing, right? So, right. And they're like, well, 1% was good enough for Michael Jordan. Not good yeah. enough for you. Yeah. You're like, yeah, no, I want 20%. <laughs> yeah. Right. We just, well, went, I, I know, we just went into La La Land. Sorry, every punk. Yeah, there sorry. There. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I am interested. You know, you've been doing this for so long and you've seen so many facets of, of not just like, I mean, forget about music industry stuff, but, you know, you've gone from being a kid in Bremerton to, you know, being on a major label and, you know, traveling the world and knowing all kinds of different people. So putting aside any of the music industry stuff, what are kind of the biggest life lessons that you have learned that have just made you grow as a human being? That's a big question. But um, I, I would say over the years, being yourself, I know that's the, the cheesiest thing ever, but really being able to like be comfortable with who you are and not get overly nervous about trying to impress people. Like anytime I go into a social situation, if I have a calm mental sort of attitude going into that positive attitude, my God, my night goes so much better. And if you're like worried about what's going to happen, this or that, oh, I might not get the right seat, you know, things like that. So like for me being sort of, I, I guess I'm anxious about some things. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, life lesson is just be try to be comfortable with with just who you are and don't give a fuck about what anybody thinks about you and was that's there been, a time where you were more concerned with like perception and impressing people and stuff my whole career being in a band it's like i know you're supposed to be the rock star you're supposed to be the guy that's like the ace in the hole right like doing right. the crazy thing oh that look at he's eddie vetter's climbing up to the top of the you know um but I never felt like that person inside, yeah. you know, I could be that person, but I not, I don't always feel like I'm that person. And so like, I think that's something that I had to like, be like, you're, you're just you, you're not that person or this person. You're just, sometimes you're crazy. Sometimes you're chill. That's who you are. And, and I think everybody's like that to a degree. Like you have a crazy self, you have, you have a calm self, you know, and you have happy, sad, all of these emotions. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's always something you have to kind of like reset, at least for me. 
mentally reset. I think that's why people go to church every Sunday. That's why people go to seminars. That's why people go to hardcore shows and get preached at mm-hmm. because yep. they need reminders of what they already know. Yep. But we just get so caught up in our day to day and our anxieties that that reminder helps us. And so music for me is a great reminder. I, I grew up listening, like once I got into punk, I was listening to a lot of Gorilla Biscuits. And like that opened up a whole new attitude for me. And and I would, yeah. I would credit them with a lot of my positive mental attitude and a lot of keeping MXPX lyrics positive, even if it starts out like, ah, oh, she dumped me or whatever. But like, ah, it's all good. I got my friends. We're having fun, you know. So <laughs> uh, another thing, you know, I've learned is just there's no easy button in life. Yeah. Um, it's if you if you have it easy, you got so lucky. But 99.9% yeah. of people don't get that lucky. And, uh, and I consider myself very lucky, you know, just not having a nine to five job, working for myself, having, you know, being able to travel all, all around the world, being part of the punk scene, being part of the music scene, all of that. I mean, yeah, I'm grateful, but it doesn't negate the fact that there's always work to be done. Yeah. And there's always, you know, it's just, it's constant. And yes, you can take breaks. I'm not saying like never take a break. What I'm saying is life is like that. It doesn't matter if you're in music. It doesn't matter if you're in real estate. When you go and you pay attention to it, it's it's something's going to happen. Maybe yep. you'll still still fail, but you definitely won't won't succeed if you don't pay attention. And like I said, there's people that get lucky and it they they succeed without paying attention. But I mean, I, anybody who was yeah. born an able-bodied human in a Western country at this moment in time won the fucking lottery. Absolutely, and just the fact that we're humans, right? Like, yeah. I'd want to be a dog until I'm like, okay, but then you're locking me (laughs) in the house all day and like, (laughs) right. Dying at nine years old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You mentioned being preached at, at a hardcore show, which is something that, um, I'm so glad you made that point because I want to talk about the Christian thing. Um, so back in the day, back in, you know, it's, it's a little different now. I think it's a lot different actually, but back in the nineties, it was totally unacceptable to like be a Christian in the hardcore scene or to even listen to any Christian bands. And they would always say, you know, these Christian bands are preachy. And I'm like, have you listened to hardcore lyrics? Like it's the preachiest shit you could imagine, which is fine. Like, I mean, that's cool. That's what I'm here for. But I always thought it was so weird that like, it's okay to be super preachy about whatever being vegan, but it's not okay to be preachy about being Christian. What's the difference? Yeah, I mean, it's just that's just it. It's the story we tell ourselves, right? Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, we never preached on stage. Um, we always got shit because we didn't, you know, when we started right, out. Right. And and it's funny that you say now it's totally different, and it is nowadays. So many punk bands, including people in Bad Religion, believe in God. Mm-hmm. And Tom Mariah from Slayer goes to church. <laughs> so many, so many punk bands. Like some members, maybe not everybody. I mean, whatever. It doesn't even matter. It's and it's kind of like that. Nobody even, cares really. Yeah, and, and and I'm like, wow, and even the fans, so many fans are out there, like some people that I knew from high school or whatever, praying on their Facebook or sending out prayers. Yeah. It's, it's like, okay, it's a different time because back in the day, that was definitely not acceptable. Right. Like you'd, get, you'd get a lot of people going like, what? What are you talking about? So things have turned. Tables have turned. I, I feel like it was, I'd be curious to know what you would think of this as someone kind of you know, on the other side of the fence, you could say, because, you know, there was a time where the secular scene and the Christian scenes were totally different. I feel like it was maybe around the time the Devil Wars Prada came out and started getting really big and under oath that those two bands kind of crossed streams. And then after that, it just became kind of a non-issue. Yeah, I think, you know, you know what they say, there's like, you know, the, you know, people that kind of come before and like get all the shit. I think MXPX, Mm -hmm was that you know people were yep. not okay with us playing punks weren't okay with us playing in churches and p- church people weren't okay with us playing in punk clubs you know it was just like right uh, okay we're just kids dude like we're not trying to fucking like we're just trying yeah. to do what we're doing like i'm you know? 17 <laughs> and i'm smoking cigarettes because i started smoking when i worked at spiros because you got a smoke break so i was like i right. oh okay i'm gonna start smoking uh-huh. so I was, I was sneaking cigarettes on these like tours we were doing these early tours and like hiding from kids which i still feel good about because it's not cool to smoke kids it's i quit long ago 
But it's just funny because it's just like there's people are always just picking at you. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it happens when you're a kid, maybe with your parents or your relatives or this or that. It happens now with your boss, with your coworkers. If you're in a band, it happens with, you know, people from the scene or whatever, you know. So I think that's just human nature. And and there's going to yeah. be people that that won't see the hypocrisy that hardcore is preaching as well as you know, maybe Christian punk or whatever, Christian music. But for us, like I said, you know, we got started. We didn't even really realize the scene was separate or anything. We were just, we want to play punk shows. That's what we want to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think my personality has a, a way of letting that roll off me like, and, and just not worry about, not worry about the hatred, not worry about like if somebody yeah. hates me, I just, ah, uh, I'm not going to worry about it, you know? Like, <laughs> I know it would probably feel different if, like, if it was, like, uh, everybody on the internet at once telling you to die. Like, sure, that that probably get a little bit much. But then at that point, you just have to not look at your phone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 there's a lot, definitely a lot of people on the internet that don't like me. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, all you can do is just be like, you're not well. Um this has nothing to do with me and everything to do with you. Absolutely. And the thing is, is like there's people that will push buttons, you know, yeah, on purpose. They just, they want to get a reaction out of you. And the more reaction they get, that's all they need. They got that, whatever, it's a viral clip or a, a screenshot yeah. of you, you commenting something. Yeah. So I, I think MXPX has fairly been fairly good at, breeding positivity online mm-hmm. you know there's always people like play here play here whatever i don't feel yeah. like that's not negative that's just people being no, no. excited that you want to play yeah here, no yeah. that's the that's the opposite of negative. yeah, yeah they're yeah, just yeah. Ex- they're just excited they want to see you yeah yeah even if they're like you suck play here <laughs> yeah can't believe you didn't come to sarasota last time are you coming this year <laughs> yeah yeah Cool. Well, uh, I know you got a lot going on, so I will let you go. But thank you very much uh, for your time here. And uh, I'm excited to check out the album when it comes out. Yeah, the album should be out by the time this comes up um, because it comes out this Friday. Oh, nice. Okay, great. Yeah, we're doing some live streams. So look for us on live stream. We're going to be playing the full album live Thursday night. And if you missed it by the time this comes out, you know, just check it. But uh, find a way home. We're excited. Cool. Well, thanks again. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Ben.